Uh, message to the government and the message to you is that developed economies are entering terra incognita on an unprecedented scale. It's sort of similar of, enter, of uh, landing on Mars, except we speak the language. And the source of uncertainty is not single. It's the combination of different sources of uncertainty. And uh, um, some of them are actually unprecedented levels. Uh, while creating scenarios that we're going to do here is very useful, I think our predictive power of all possible interactions and contingencies is very limited. We don't even have in economics a model that would somehow model that. And so the bottom line of my remarks is we are in for a very, very bumpy and uncertain ride that is, uh, that is filled with possibilities and dangers. And so the only thing I could uh, suggest is to engage in massive risk management exercise, both mitigating the risks and buying insurance. Uh, the problem is that people are very bad in assessing risks, and uh, so is the media, unfortunately. Sorry, the representatives. And so we don't push our leaders to actually engage in this exercise. We don't reward them for that. And this is from six years in the government. And so between the worries of today and the two worries of tomorrow, today always wins. So this is huge problem. Uh, this is a huge political economy problem, which we somehow need to figure out how to solve. Uh, because otherwise we will be uh, running headlong into, into a huge problem. And so why do, why do I think that this is a very big terra incognita? First, longevity and low birth rates. We are going into the world where pay-as-you-go systems no longer work. Japan, if anybody wants to look how our future looks like, look at Japan. 25% of people under, uh, over the age of 65 and the uh, population is shrinking. Uh, people will have to work longer and more productively to be able to uh, have, uh, to, to support themselves in retirement and their dependents. Second, uh, in economic domain, we have uh, record high debt, debt levels, low growth, 300-year uh, record low interest rates. We've, if you look at the Bank of England, the interest rates have never been anywhere in the vicinity where they are now. And so there's high competition from developing countries the internal growth is very limited, and the external growth is everybody wants external growth, and so there are currency wars. And so there is a huge source of uncertainty there. There is a global mobility of jobs. Jobs migrate, low-end jobs migrate to places where, uh, where the wages are low. High-end uh, jobs uh, migrate. Uh, they, they usually stay, but, but there's a fierce competition for them. So people migrate. Uh, I am uh, trying to, to, to uh, um, convince our government that they can no longer take as given that their citizens will be there tomorrow if, if we don't do something to make the country competitive for them. In a world with aging society, this is a very big problem. So if your more, more skilled part of the population leaves and keeps the, the the aging part uh, there, nobody will be there to care for the aging part. So this is, this is a big problem. We had something like that happen in Israeli kibbutz, because what happened is that the most productive people left the kibbutz and left the elderly, and, this, and so, of course, the country stepped in, et cetera, but, but as, if you take it as a, as a metaphor for a country, there could be a big problem. We have global mobility of companies. Companies are much more global. There is a much less attachment between the locale and the company, and so that gives us uh, much less investment in human capital. Companies want human capital to be ready for them rather than to invest long term if they, if they are mobile. And the second thing, that they are no longer viewed as a source of prosperity by the locales, uh, and so that, is, that creates uh, mistrust in, in, in companies in general. Um, there's also uh, competition to the bottom by countries for uh, regulation, in some areas for regulation, for, for income taxes, uh, corporate taxes, uh, etc. Some efforts uh, go against that, like BEPS and, and Paris Summit on, on climate change, but, uh, but it's not clear whether these could survive if times become tough, okay? Because those, again, this is the, the, the problems of today versus problem of tomorrow's. Climate change. Apart from the climate change that we all know about and the uncertainty associated with it, uh, you have the world finally came together and decided to introduce economic implications of climate change. It's a huge, for individual countries, this could be uh, positive uh, versus, but for the world as, uh, as a whole, it's a huge hangover uh, that we have to deal with. 
And then finally, tech shocks that we, uh, that we all know about and, and we're going to talk about them. Uh, I don't know whether they're going to replace us or not replace us, the computers I mean. I don't know who is uh, David Order or, or and, uh, Andrew McAfee are right. Uh, Keynes, after all, spoke about technological employment in 1930 and didn't, didn't map out. But at the same time, we have to admit that since 2000, the employment never reached, uh, again, after two, uh, two shocks. The employment, uh, the percentage of employed in the United States, for example, never reached the peak of uh, 2000. So we don't know, maybe this is, uh, maybe Keynes uh, uh, worries uh, are uh, manifesting themselves, uh, you know, 70, 80 years later. But what, do, what all of us agree upon, I mean, what both Author and, and uh, McAfee agree upon, is that uh, these shocks, these technological shocks will intensify. Yesterday I read on the way here in the economist that now machines can s stitch two pieces of clothing together. Okay, it didn't used to be possible. Okay, now it is possible. Imagine what it does to the textile industry in terms of employment. Okay, this is, you know, to several cameras and, and, and a few cogs. Um, we don't know. We don't know where these shocks will hit. We don't know how will they affect the labor force. Whether they will have hollowing out with a massive unemployment, but they will massively affect the labor force. We don't really have the economic models to address this because I'm not. At least I'm not aware. Maybe there's work being done. I haven't been following that literature. And then finally, there is additional source of uncertainty is the changing attitudes and preferences of the public. I mean, this uh, unprecedented and completely unpredictable connectivity can uh, allow manipulation of public opinions uh, on massive scale. We have lower trust uh, because a lot of people pass all kinds of ideas. We, uh, we have this, uh, this huge problem for the governments ability to govern. And so that creates a volatile, um, volatile environment, extremely volatile environment, much more winner-take-all leading to inequality and social tensions, a reduction of levels of trust, you know, the shocks to the labor force, uncertainty for the individual, uh, individual and danger of developing social, pervasive social norms associated with massive idleness. Uh, this, is, this has been done in, 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 this been observed in various places where certain government programs that were, uh, that were geared to alleviate certain social problems created these massive changes in, in, in social norms which are extremely difficult to change. We have this example in Israel uh, with the ultra-Orthodox, uh, the participation in the labor force is dismal and we are trying to now to, to, to climb out of that hole that we dug ourselves for 60 years. And so that is, that is the problem, and uh, I wanted to, to sort of uh, uh, talk at two minutes about solutions and then come back to the problem. There are two, essentially two types of solutions as we see this. Uh, one solution is cling to the familiar, okay? We tendency to try to contain the change, huddle together in the, in the face of danger, and keep the status quo. Uh, frequently, this creates adversarial relations between those who want some change or, or, or we're ready for change and those who don't. And this is a bad idea. It can, if the change is passing uh, and it's like a, a perturbance, uh, then, then, then it's, it may work. But uh, if the change is massive and unavoidable, this is really a bad idea because you will die uh, as an organization along with the, with the change that you cannot stop. An alternative, of course, is to embrace the future, enjoy the opportunities, but of course manage the risks because the risks are very, very severe. A strategy that looks forward, uh, identifies the risks as they arise, and embeds flexibility into every economic and social system, starting from the individual, the firm, the government, and the social, uh, is, the, is, is, is the solution, uh, in our opinion. And I'll, I'll tell you uh, an example, sorry to bring the military into this. Uh, but, um, you know, we had, uh, we knew uh, since early 2000s that, uh, you know, several organizations around our borders arming themselves with a lot of rockets and that these rockets at some point will be launched at us. And there were, you know, actually thousands and thousands of them. And so we had to figure out how do we defend our population given that the size of the country is, is probably the area of, of Madrid and a little bit uh, more of that. So uh, we, we, we thought ahead, uh, we sort of re, um, analyzed the problem, 
And we came up with a very, very flexible system, uh, which is called the Iron Dome, which can, uh, within 45 seconds, can identify uh, a launch of a rocket, figure out what kind of rocket that is, figure out where it's going to land, decide whether to intercept it, and then intercept it hitting with a counter rocket in the place where the explosives are, because you can't just hit it because it will f fall and, and explode in a different place. Uh, all that you can do to 10 rockets simultaneously. Okay, so we've, uh, this, is, this is something for, for me, it's a metaphor of what we all have to become. Okay, people, you know, we have to anticipate where the dangers come from, be able to analyze the situation very quickly and respond in, within 45 seconds, you know, on, on, the, on the human scale. So it's, it includes individuals. This, is, this implies different educational formats, easy access to, to, to learning tools, tools to quickly adapt to the changing environment, massive revamping of curricula and of teaching methods, lifelong learning, easy separation and connection as a culture of jobs and organizations, uh, using experience, uh, a lot of entrepreneurships. Firms and organizations level, we have to be uh, constantly innovating in the sense of adapting to new environment. Uh, those who will not innovate will, uh, will, who will not be able to change, and I always bring the, the example of Kodak because I was a professor at the University of Rochester for eight years, and I watched it die. I mean, because for a simple reason that it invented digital photography, was invented in Kodak, and it couldn't shake its own image of a chemical company. This was unbelievable. I mean, you were talking, I was teaching their executives, it was just unbelievable. They were, not, they were not in connection with what they were doing and what this will do to themselves. Government, I mean, we, the government has to steer long term, but be prepared to A, accept innovation. It's very difficult in the government to accept innovation. The, the, the incentives are not there. Uh, innovate internally and spur innovation around it. It's not, it's not trivial because trust is required and there, is a, and there is a fear of failure. And of course, social contract. The high trust is, uh, is absolutely essential. We, we call it the North European model. Uh, it, it, it affects labor relations, it affects uh, mutual assistance, let's say earned income credits, perhaps a national service to, to, to make everyone contribute and mix socialize in the population. We do that out of necessity, but, but it actually has very positive uh, uh, implications. These efforts, all of this, what I said, are very expensive and take managerial attention from the current tasks. There's also a lot of political uh, pushback because vested interests, teachers unions, threatened businesses, regulators, ideological opponents on the, pol on the political level, all of these want to derail that because there is, a, there is no benefit to actually prevent something that will happen in 15 years. Nobody gets elected for preventing something terrible happening in 10 years. Nobody does not get elected for not preventing it. That's just, that's just the way of life. And so you need a lot of political capital and a lot of trust for you to actually do that. And there's, it requires common goals and bipartisanship, which we unfortunately don't have. So, you know, I always bring the, the example of Singapore, where continuity of a political system allows you actually to think forward and spend a lot of resources and a lot of thought and a lot of buy-in into actually predicting the future. There's one thing to say about the media, it can play one of two roles. It can keep morale and cohesiveness and, and, and push the leaders to actually focus on, on the future, or it can play the blaming game, exposed and undermining the trust in the government and then not letting, then you, you essentially, um, what's called in, 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 in Hebrew and in English is cover your ass uh, attitude, uh, and, and, and that, is what, that is what the problem. So I, I want to finish with the fact that the political economy of risk management we have to engage in is, is, is very difficult, and has to, but at the same time has to be done. So if you ask me what's the problem, I think this is it. Thank you.